rough translation of homily by Father Pyotr Pavlukevich into English. The name of this homily, The People You Don't Like. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Gospel of St. John. When Judas left the room, Jesus said, The Son of Man is now glorified, and in him God has been glorified. Since God has glorified him, he is glorifying himself. Children, I am with you only for a short time more. You are going to look for me. But like the Jewish people who I told, I will now tell you. The place where I am going, you cannot go. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you so that you would all love each other and after this everyone will know that you are my apostles, my disciples if you are going to love one another. The word of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, for the Jewish people in the times of the Old Testament, love was the absolute foundation of their morality. It was the foundation of their covenant with God. And for the Jewish people, uh, the rules, uh, the the rules were very important. They were sacred. They were, they were holy. And now Jesus says to them, "I'm giving you a new rule. I'm giving you a new commandment." This was a huge shock for them. This was like a shock wave to have a new commandment. In their culture, a new commandment wasn't just something extra that you wrote down at the end of the page. It's hard to explain. And it's hard to find an example to explain. And the examples I have right now in my mind are maybe not the best ones. It's kind of like if you were driving in your car, and instead of having the steering wheel on the left side, it would be on the right side. It would be like tomorrow morning you woke up, and in Poland uh, you have to drive on the left side of the road. <laughs> it's something like, hey, you know, you didn't know about this, but you have actually one more child. So, you know, in addition to the two or three or four you have at home, you have one more you, you didn't know about. It was, in other words, an earthquake for the Jewish people, this new commandment. Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. A new commandment. We often, with regard to this new commandment of Jesus, we 
A my tego nowego przykazania, przyznam się, że nie zauważamy. Uh, that which would be this big shock to the Jewish culture at the time, for us, this commandment is not that shocking. I don't want to say for everybody, I don't want to generalize for everyone. But we don't really even realize the importance or the newness of this commandment. Jesus said, if you follow this commandment, everyone will know that you are my disciples. This will be a sign to the world. Po zachowaniu nowego przykazania. Kochani, kto z was powie, o, u mnie w pracy jest jeden facet, bo on zachowuje nowe przykazania. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, who among you would say, for example, oh, we have this new person in work, and he's following this new commandment of Jesus. U mnie jest tak. A, to ja znałem takiego jednego na uczelni. I knew... Uh, somebody like this when uh, I was in school. He he held this new commandment of Jesus in high in a high place. And we are supposed to be known for this new commandment. Oh look, there are those people who love each other and who help each other. Jesus wanted this to be a symbol to the world of Christianity. Why? Why is it this way that, that we don't we don't really uh, understand the depth of this new commandment? Why is it that we don't? Probably because in the Bible there is many things written about love. In the Old Testament also there is a lot of um, passages dedicated to love. In the Psalms, for example, um, in many books of the Old Testament there are many beautiful words of love. And we have become so desensitized to this word love that when it appears in the Bible or in a homily, for example, we kind of tune out. Oh, somebody's talking about love, it's going to get very boring now. Unless, of course, they're talking about physical love. And that could be something very interesting. And when it comes to love, maybe the, the women in the, in the congregation will, will listen a little bit more, but the men, when they hear this word, they, their, their intestines start to, uh, start to shake. When we hear about love, I, I would say something like, Dear brothers and sisters who are here today in the church of St. Anne, love each other. Many of us automatically say, we know this, we know. Of course. I remember the... Um, uh, a boy who, uh, who uh, I was observing. He was acting as an altar boy and he was serving for the Holy Mass. Uh, he was an altar boy for many years. He used to say this word, of course, of course. Anything I would say to him, Richard, and he would say, of course. When I would say the Holy Mass and I would say, Peace be with you, he would respond, Of course. And we have this kind of answer uh, when we hear uh, the, the, the commandment to love. We say, Of course. But this is a new commandment of Jesus. 
This is the essence of the gospel, of the good news. We don't, we, we don't listen to this very carefully, and the whole flavor of this is in the second part, which is, like I have loved you, like Jesus, like I, Jesus, have loved you. If it was just, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, If it was just that, uh oh. Esencja Ewangelii. Nie słuchamy tego pilnie, a cały smaczek jest tej drugiej części. Miłujcie się wzajemnie do wiemy, ale jak ja was ubiłam. Do tej pory było miłujcie się. So the whole flavor of the gospel is in this new commandment. And up until now, in the Bible, uh, through the Old Testament, love, love one another. Love one another was a commandment. But Jesus, Jesus added a new dimension, as I have loved you. Love one another was like the top of the mountain. It was uh, the most important commandment. And if someone failed to um, help and love one another, they were they were failure. They didn't live out their ultimate mission. But it was kind of an easy one to understand. Uh, do you want somebody to beat you up? Uh, no, no, I don't. So then, don't beat anybody up. You want somebody to rob you? Well, no, no, I don't. Well, don't, don't rob anybody. You want somebody to uh, uh, con you out of some money? No? Well, then don't you con somebody out of money. But on the other side of this, to say love one another as you love yourself is very dangerous because not everyone loves themselves. In fact, many people hate themselves. Many people are so judgmental of themselves they don't forgive themselves. They don't give themselves any kind of slack. And if I don't give slack to myself, why should I give slack to my neighbor? And so, uh, I see one person, and I'm judgmental, because I'm judgmental of myself. I see another person, and I'm judgmental, because I'm judgmental of myself. If I'm a workaholic, and I'm going to fill up my day, and work every day until midnight, then you, my husband, you should also be like me. You should work till midnight. So you see, this love one another as you love yourself is somewhat dangerous because if you don't love yourself very much, then how can you love someone else? Of course, if we all loved each other and loved ourselves, it would be wonderful and the world would be a better place. But many people have problem with this. And in fact, many people have to start to like themselves and love themselves before they can even start to try to keep this command.
So this word, love one another as I have, uh, love, love one another as you love yourself, this, these are words to a popular religious song that we sing here in Poland. So many of us know these words. And even in this song, uh, that is very popular uh, for um, uh, religion classes for children, uh, if I remember correctly, the part about, as I have loved you, is not in the song. Right, so love your neighbor as yourself, but the part about as I have loved you um, is missing from that song. And it would be as if it lost flavor. And so this new commandment of Jesus isn't love one another as you love yourself. Love each other as I have loved you. And why is it that we don't feel that this is something new, that this commandment is new for us? Why doesn't it feel shocking to us, like an earthquake? Because before Christianity, not only in Israel, but in the whole world, people loved each other. I'm not a historian, but the ancient peoples, they loved each other. The, the ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans, they could form love relationships. And if you look at world history or you go back in history, you can find so many examples where even someone died for someone else out of love. So, uh, someone can say to you, uh, or to me, uh, what's so new about this commandment? We know, all, we know all about this commandment. Well, let's look at Jesus. He gave his life for all of us, for the people. There were people there standing during his crucifixion. There were soldiers there. And um, even soldiers, for example, uh, know uh, to, uh, often, soldiers often will give up their life for their fellow man, for their fellow soldier, for their country. So what's so new here? Of course, uh, if you're familiar with the movie The Gladiator, uh, in fact, he wasn't even a Christian, and he had uh, these kinds of uh, virtues. And so people lived like this before uh, the time of Christ's life and Christ's resurrection. So, we hear again these words, love one another as you love yourself. It's kind of, we become desensitized. But Jesus didn't die just for his mother or for his uh, friends, the apostles, or for um, the people of Jerusalem. He died for everyone, including his enemies. And with that si same kind of love, with that same kind of love, he died for his friends, just as for his enemies. He was m the most humble going to the cross. Even though at any moment he could just snap his fingers and this would be over. Right? The, 
he would snap his fingers and the, the Roman soldiers could, would all die on the spot. But he decided not to do that. And he allowed himself to be humbled, humbled until death. He died for his enemies, who the whole time, through the whole 33 years of his life on this world, he loved them. And in fact, going back to the beginning of the world, the people have loved each other, but usually it was a uh, love of family. You know, a, a father would love his child. Uh, a mother would love her child. Uh, a sibling would love his sibling. A, a family-based love. Or a man would see a woman and fall in love with her and, and, and have a family with her. And then wherever they settled in the neighborhood, they would try to live together peacefully because that was uh, in their favor. And so if they saw that their neighbor was in uh, under threat, they would help their neighbor. I'm going to help my neighbor, I'm going to help my country. But Jesus' love isn't due to blood connections as family or not because he saw somebody and he fell in love with them. It just is that he loves each of us so much that he decided to accept this. That's how he is. I think the biggest reason why we can't really understand this commandment of Jesus because we can't, it doesn't fit into our into our brain. We can't comprehend something like this. It doesn't fit into our brain. We can't understand this new commandment. But it is very very new in the in the history of the world. Because it demands of us something that we can barely understand. Uh, Simon Sipari wrote in his book, Twierdza, a person has an unbelievable ability to to forgetting important things. It's something unbelievable. It's like a family would get together in the car and head out for a vacation. Because they're going to the ocean. They're sitting in the car at 7 o'clock in the morning. And the child says, Dad, I'm sorry that I'm bothering you now. But um, didn't you forget to turn on the car? Like we're sitting here and uh, the engine's not on. We're sitting in the car for seven hours. Dad, but the engine's not on. And I just see the garbage can in front of our house. The whole time. And of course, those of you listening to this will say, that's absurd. I mean, how could, how could something like that even be conceived? And how can we, therefore, not see that Jesus says that he's giving us a new commandment? And we say, oh yeah, of course, obviously. But tomorrow, my mother-in-law, when I see her on this vacation, I can't wait. I can't wait to tell her what I think of her. Peace be with you. And also with you, we say in church. 
oh, but tomorrow at work, I'm really going to let my boss have it, or my co-worker. I'm going to really get that. I'm going to, I'm going to make them feel so bad. We don't see anything wrong with this. My dear brothers and sisters, do you know uh, it would be for me, and, and indeed there, there are these kinds of people, who say, excuse me, uh, Father, I just don't know how to love. I keep trying to learn. I just don't know how, but I keep trying to learn. And I'm sure there are young people out there like that. When, a, when a, for example, a young man uh, goes to a young woman, and, and he says to her, I, I like you very much, you're, you're a very interesting person. I'm, I'm kind of hypnotized by your beauty and by your uh, wonderful personality. Uh, would you like to learn how to love with me? Because really, uh, usually the way this goes is... Oh, I love you more than anything in the world. You're everything to me. Let's go, let's go to dances, let's go to clubs, let's go to bars, let's have as much fun as we can. You're the whole purpose of my life. I'll give, I'll do anything for you. And then these kinds of fairy tales we, we say, we say out loud, we speak to each other. And in fact, it's just one lie after the next. It really should be like this. I see that together we would have a chance to really learn to learn love. And she'll say back to him, you know what, I think you're right. Why don't we start dating and going out? And we're going to learn how to love each other. And you know, and maybe after three years we'll tell each other, you know what? I really know how to love you. Maybe it won't be three years. Maybe it'll be faster than three years. Maybe it'll be longer than three years. That's that's real life. All of the fairy tales that someone's learned about in the beginning, they meet at a discotheque or a nightclub, and uh, they're dancing to the jive, and then they get engaged, and then the blues start to play. These are these are fairy tales. In truth, love is really hard work. We have to love like Jesus so that we, so that we can be like Jesus. In, in some regards, a religion says only Jesus redeemed himself. And only Jesus is saved, and only Jesus can go to heaven. But wait, how can how can that uh, uh, agree with our with our Catholic faith? But we do have a chance. But to the degree that we make ourselves like Jesus. Remember the Old Testament story when Esau uh, wanted to go to uh, his father uh, for the blessing. And when Jacob and his mother heard this, they came up with a plan to dress Jacob up like Esau because his father's vision had been failing. So Jacob and his mother 
He came up with this plan uh, to dress up Jacob like Esau. So when Esau went to Isaac, Isaac gave him his blessing. And so our whole hope for the judgment day, our whole hope is that God the Father will have bad vision. We're going to come to him and he's going to say, who are you? And we're going to say, I'm Jesus. Look, I'm Jesus. I spoke like Jesus. I acted like Jesus. I love people like Jesus. And, and God, you know, older and with, with not the most perfect vision. He'll say, okay, great. If you're Jesus, come on in. Come on into heaven. And in fact, this is not a joke. I, I'm telling you the truth. We have to take on Jesus in our life if we want to go to heaven. In our body, the degree to which we are holy is the degree to which Jesus is in our hearts. I remember a story about a woman named Blessed uh, Elizabeth when she was dying. She was a mystic a religious mystic, and when she was dying her face, they say, uh, reminded everyone who saw her at this time of Jesus' face. This is how we must be together with Jesus. St. Paul said that I am no longer alive, but in me lives Jesus. We have to uh, follow in Jesus' footsteps. And not, not in our own, something that we just kind of come up with on our own, but in Jesus's. Indeed, at the final judgment that we all must face, there is going to be a criterion. And the, and the criterion is going to be, are we like Jesus? And is Jesus in us? So, what else is blocking us from kind of uh, appreciating the newness of this commandment that Jesus gave? When we read the, the scriptures, we see that there were some people that Jesus really liked, uh, that he favored. And his mother, uh, Saint John the Apostle, he had, uh, Mary Magdalene and Martha. And this very same Jesus, sometimes to a group of people, would have a very um, sharp words. If you don't uh, repent, you will die in your sins, he would say. He was just like all of us. I have, for example, people who I like. My friend, my sister, my friend from college. And I have those in my mind who sometimes I treat like Jesus. Uh, with sharp words. Uh, he was like us. Uh, he had people who he liked. He had people who he didn't like that much. To one group he would go, to another group he would not go. To one person he would speak, to another person he wouldn't speak. To Herod he wouldn't even uh, answer a word. The words of this new commandment are a little bit, you know, too much. 
Oczywiście on był lepszy, on był szlachetniejszy, ale jednak w schemacie swoich relacji z ludźmi Of course Jesus was better than us and uh, kinder and had a more pure heart than we did. But in his relationship with people, he had people who he preferred and people who he didn't. I don't know how it was exactly. I, I don't know what it means when we say Jesus liked or Jesus didn't like. He, the Bible tells us that he loved John and that he had special um, a special uh, love for John. And uh, what we know is that when uh, John was following Jesus, he was very young. He was still uh, a prob most likely a teenager. Probably less than 15. Uh, recently, uh, I started to laugh when I heard some uh, uh, a radio show recently that said that John was uh, the son of a shelf. He would walk around, he was nice, he would smile, he would help out. So Jesus liked him. He had a good relationship with him. But I know one thing for sure. Jesus loved everyone. He may not have liked everyone, but he loved everyone. Uh, my brothers and sisters, let us be honest and admit that when we don't speak to someone because uh, someone has angered us, and we see them in the hallway, and uh, this person says, hey, let's talk, and we just shut the door. And then we say, ah, feel bad. You should feel bad. I was feeling bad before. Feel my revenge here. And now you can beg me, because now uh, that's what it's going to take uh, to, to come back. You see, you see how this is, you see. But, but Jesus, when he didn't speak to a person, it was something else. I'm begging you, surprise the truth. Let my silence provoke you to start thinking about your soul so that you can better understand. It was silence, but it was not uh, the same kind of silence. When we yell at somebody else often, we want to put that person down. We want to put ourselves up and put that person down. Jesus uh, raised his voice. But he raised his voice to say, come back to God because you're headed straight to hell. He, he would shout, be careful, you're going to fall, you're going to have uh, risk, risk your soul. Be, be careful because this is not from God, this is from the other, the evil one. Na zewnątrz możemy rzeczywiście Jezusa oceniać jako, że miał swoje sympatie, antypatie. Nie, On wszystkich miłował. We can look at Jesus from the outside and say He was kind or not kind to people, but He loved everyone. Na krzyżu jeszcze patrzył na tego łodę. Even when He was on the cross and He looked at the thieves to His right and to His left. No przyjrzyj się mojej męce, no łodę. And, and He was basically saying to them, look at my passion, look at my uh, my desire to save you. But say something. Speak. The same way he looked at everyone that was looking at him that day. 
At the centurion, for example, he was saying to the centurion, look, look, I'm doing this out of love and love for you too. Come back. Uh, come back to God. Come to God. Uh, return. Work on your soul and your relationship. And with the centurion, it had an effect. The centurion, who was a high-ranking Roman, said, "This is this truly. This was the Son of God. Everything that Jesus did was for the purpose of saving souls. If he was sleeping, or if he was yelling, or if he was laughing, he was doing it to save souls. Everything." We, in our ways, are very different. He loved people, not even for one second did he stop, until the end. Never ended in his love of them. We have to give our conscience an important question, an uncomfortable question. Do I love everyone? This, of course, remember that our moral theology says that we have um, a duty. Uh, it's, it's, it's written when we throw, for example, a stone into the water. First, you must love yourself, your wife, your kids, your parents. Then you have to love the people who are close to you, who are a little bit more distant. Maybe your neighbor from across the street. Uh, your co-worker. But this isn't like someone at work says, oh, my friend from work needs money. So I take away the bread from my wife and children to help this person. No, if you have to choose between caring for your family and caring for someone else, you have to choose your family. First you have to feed your wife and then... Then, if there's something left over, you can feed uh, the church, you can feed uh, people in need. Of course, it's not good if someone sends all their money to Haiti uh, disaster relief and then neglects taking care of their own children. First, he has to feed his children. And then if you have money left over, you can send it to Haiti. So the question is, do I love everyone? But you have to remember the people closest to you. So when the husband is crying, the wife should ask, why are you crying? Oh, he may say, I read a sad story or I watched a sad movie. It's unlikely that it would be such a sensitive thing, but um, it's important. But do you love everyone to the degree that you should? Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, very often I see when I'm standing online in the supermarket, for example, somebody in front of me pulls out their wallet and in the wallet is a picture of someone they love, maybe their wife or maybe their child, mother. This is very beautiful. But you have to believe me.
people have pictures of their loved ones uh, on the wall in their homes, on the desks in their jobs. But if uh, Jesus, uh, but if we would look, if we would look at the times before Jesus, the pagans would also have done something like that if they could. They would have pictures of their loved ones. Uh, it, 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 it's not what um, distinguishes you as a Christian. We actually should take a picture of a person that we that we emotionally can't can't tolerate, that we can't stand. Who we just don't like and maybe we wish them bad even. Which, by the way, is wrong. But we should uh, take their picture and put it on the shelf. I could kind of close my eyes and picture already who, who this could be. I won't say anything, but we have to really ask ourselves does this person who I think is a really bad and, and mean person do I love this person? It doesn't mean that. Uh, I love everything about him and uh, I love them in a romantic way. But the question is, do I wish this person that they go to heaven one day? Do I uh, wish that he would uh, repent and return to God? Uh, do I wish that this person would uh, forgive and, uh, uh, well, seek forgiveness and then return to God? Uh, do I say to this person, Go over your conscience and go to confession and come back to Jesus so that you can go to heaven. Really, you really should do this. Uh, take a picture, for example, of your uh, former boyfriend. The one who you'd like, you'd tear this picture up in a million pieces. Or this politician who you can't stand. Or this professor who once told you you were dumb, or that you were unable to uh, uh, to make it in your in your field, and put it put it in a glass frame on your desk, and ask yourself, do I love this person? This is the new commandment that Jesus has given us. This, however, is work major work. And I will repeat one more time, to love doesn't mean to like emotionally. I'll give you a, an example. Uh, all of us here in Poland are um, always uh, thinking about the big Smolensk disaster where the airplane crashed. Now we are often talking about whose fault is this. But I always um, pay attention to one thing. How we Polish people are very sensitive. And this is a good sign. Uh, how we are sensitive to people's pain. When that airplane uh, was destroyed, from that moment, I heard even in the uh, in the the different churches that oh, on this plane there was communists and the post-communists. I thought I would hear that, but no one said that. The whole Poland was uh, wondering. 
uh, or was surprised. The whole country was surprised that even people who didn't like President Lech Kaczynski uh, were saying good things about him after he died. Why? Well, listen, what can I say? What, well, there's nothing I can say about the, this disaster. But when you look at the, the airplane and how it was in pieces and how uh, there were people buried without body parts, uh, without head, for example. They did DNA testing to figure out who was who. So this, this was um, a large enough national crisis that we stopped talking about political parties, whether it was the leftists or the rightists or the post-communists. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, that boy, uh, the child who they found, uh, who, uh, who had died, and they don't know who, who, who it, whose child this was when it was time for his funeral. Thousands of people came for this funeral, for this child who nobody knew who it was. But people would say, what a tragedy, this is a child, how could this have happened? And uh, they found him in the water. When we see that someone is suffering very much, then we just give them absolution. Uh, in Poland, it's a tradition that we never talk badly of someone who has passed away, uh, because it's it's not our it's not our tradition. So I'm sorry to say this, but I have this kind of idea. Maybe it's a dumb idea, or maybe it's not. Take a picture of someone, the person who you just don't like the most, the person who you can't stand, and take it to a computer specialist. And this computer specialist will know how to do this. And let them take this picture of this person and make this person look absolutely miserable and in pain. That they have a horrible expression on their face, of sadness, a crooked, a crooked lips, and a tremendous pain on their face. And and look at this picture. Because this is how people look in hell. And start praying for this person, that they won't ever have to look like, like that or go to hell. Maybe this will change our hearts. Because we usually see a sinner and and once again I'll return to the airplane tragedy if that airplane didn't crash if they had gotten to cotton and then let's say after the ceremony was over they went to some kind of hotel for dinner I don't know if that was the plan but let's say that that was what was going to happen and we would see the relationships going on and the politicians there, many of us would say something like, oh, they went themselves to Katyn for a, for a vacation on our, on our dime. Look how they're eating well and having fun. They would, they would judge the whole life of this person just based on the image they saw but when we saw the broken pieces of the airplane and we started to think uh, about the bodies and about uh, the, the, the scale of this disaster and all of us said oh my goodness oh my god how, how Jesus how could this be Everyone was saying, uh, 
the best minds of our young, uh, the best young minds of our country. Nobody said, oh, the best minds uh, of Poland except for so and so. No, everyone together was a tremendous loss to us. Because this suffering had a major effect on us. Remember, this person who you can't stand, maybe it's your former boyfriend, or your former girlfriend, or maybe, or maybe it's your in-laws, uh, think that they, they may be going on the road to hell. And in hell, they're going to suffer tremendous pain. So, something like this Smolensk plane crash will be like nothing, like a drop in the bucket compared to what, uh, what's waiting in hell. And maybe this will um, touch a, a us to think that this is how Jesus saw people. He saw, for example, Herod wearing this uh, royal gowns and this golden rings. And when he looked at him, with all of this worldly uh, possessions, Jesus could see the poor soul beneath it all. When he saw all of these powerful Romans uh, with the symbol of Pilate on their chests, I, I don't know uh, what, what happened to Pilate after death, but when Jesus saw a person, he saw who they really are. This is why he cried over Jerusalem. He cried over Jerusalem. You see, your point of view depends on your, your where you're sitting. Many people are uh, surprised when a marriage starts out so wonderfully oh, and a baby has come into the marriage a little child and the little child said to me mama, mama I love you mama you're everything to me but now years later everything is upside down there's no more marriage. There's no more son. Why? Uh, because uh, most of the time this wasn't true love. This wasn't the new commandment. And only love will survive. You see, when we go to weddings, it's very often uh, the case that we read about love from Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Love never ends. Love uh, carries all things. Um, love holds all things. Well, how come it didn't hold the crisis in my marriage? How come uh, my love for my son ended this way? How come he turned his back on me and he uh, left Poland and went to Ireland and uh, doesn't call? How come? The answer is because it wasn't really love. Uh, it was um, uh, something else. It was um, pretend. It was uh, uh, favoritism. It was something else, but it wasn't love. Uh, it was uh, flirting. Um, 
or having fun, but it wasn't love. It was playing on emotions. It was playing with um, uh, someone's future. And that's why it ended. True love will never end, will never fall apart. And that's why this new love that Jesus showed us, all of the other imitations of love will fall apart, but not the love that Jesus taught us. It would be something like this. If, if we saw two, two automobiles uh, riding side by side, the exact same car, and they're, they're riding down a hill, and we, we see them both going down the hill. It's very beautiful. The cars are new and shiny. They're going down the hill at an equal pace. Uh, everything looks great. The same car, the same road. But when the travel down the hill ends, it's time to go up the hill on the other side. But now we only see one car driving up the hill. What happened to the other one? Well, uh, what happened was that other car looked the same, but it had no engine. And so it could go downhill, but it couldn't go up. Very often we have two engaged couples. They, they're both sitting in a cafe somewhere. Two, two men, two women, they're engaged. They're randomly sitting in a cafe somewhere. They're hugging each other. They're holding hands. They are saying compliments to each other and they're happy. And they're smiling to each other. And they both are in love. But one couple, the relationship ends after one year, while the other couple uh, survives uh, uh, and the marriage uh, happens and they're together for 50 years. Why? Why is it like that? They both had the same uh, intentions. They both had the same experiences. The answer is that one of them had an engine and the other didn't. And so the other couple uh, was, was just riding down the hill but had no engine to be able to go up a hill when difficulty came. Another example would be that uh, this couple that didn't make it, they were like a sailboat. And a sailboat can only sail if there's wind. The gospel is very concrete. It's very concrete and very clear. In, in the Bible, we also read about the apostles and how they went from town to town. And when it was time, uh, when they were, when they were, uh, when they had uh, gotten many converts and uh, the community started to build churches, they would assemble in the church and say how, how God had helped them to bring this community together. And it was very important to realize that when this would happen, the apostles would meet, and they would come together to uh, share in the joy uh, of this success and to thank God for it. But, but Jesus uh, also sent out disciples uh, while he was alive on the earth. 
And their stories was very different. Uh, they would come back and say, they threw us out of the town, or they spit on us. And so how do you recognize love? Uh, love is full of thankfulness. I think uh, I have told you before, uh, uh, during one of my prior homilies, uh, so how do you recognize love? Love is complete and joyful thankfulness. I once heard a saying that I believe has a lot of uh, validity, and in fact when I heard it, uh, the hair stood up on my neck. For those, and, and the saying goes like this, for those who go to hell, everything is hell. When I listen to those conversations in the city, oh, uh, I'm having such a rough uh, time. Um, I don't like this. I don't like that. Everything is wrong. Everything is bad. Oh, the sun is out. Oh, it's going to rain anyway. It's going to rain in a little while. Oh, tomorrow we have a day off. Ah, so what? Uh, we still got to go to work the, the day after tomorrow. And, and for those who go to heaven, for them, everything is heaven. Uh, their love is thankful. Everyone in this room, everyone listening to this homily, our lives can be looked at from two different points of view. Either it can be beautiful, or it can be absolutely bitter and, and difficult. I can uh, tell you an example of my life where one side of uh, the story looks uh, absolutely wonderful, while the other uh, way I can tell the story will make it look absolutely horrible. And so both of those versions are actually correct. It all depends on how we uh, present this uh, to others and to ourselves. To love like Jesus is a strength that could never be overcome. To love like Jesus, it's a, it's a most powerful strength. And in fact, it is a gift of the Spirit. Uh, Holy Spirit, teach me. Teach me to love like Jesus. Help me to overcome my, uh, my negativity and the way I present things about my life. For help me to overcome the things that I dislike. You see, in this world, we're in a big, uh, uh, a big chaos. I remember when uh, a man told me a story, uh, how he fell in love with the last woman that he had been speaking to. When I come home and I talk to uh, Kasha, uh, I fall in love with her. But the next day, he told, tells the story, uh, I go and I have a conversation with Gosha, and I love Gosha. 
Uh, I must not uh, be uh, ready emotionally for a long-term relationship. And this man went on to tell me that I'm very fortunate to understand this, that I've come to this conclusion, and my only regret is that I had to hurt several people along the way. by telling them I love them when in fact I didn't even know what love means. Holy Spirit, come and burn these things. Take these things away. Take the false things away and teach me to love true, truly. Like Jesus and to love everyone, and this is a very difficult, um, uh, this is a very difficult uh, request, should it be granted. Let us start to learn love, true love. And a very difficult uh, uh, aspect of love is to pay attention, is to notice things. And usually when we notice things, this is the beginning of an argument. I saw some things I didn't like. Uh, I threw him out of my apartment. I'm seeing a side of him I didn't know. So let me say a few words about this. If you want to uh, scold someone uh, or correct someone because you've noticed something that troubles you, uh, remember, don't do this uh, uh, in a uh, roundabout way. Go to church or at least sit down in your home Uh, beat your chest with your hand and say, why do I want to tell this person about this? Why do I want to bring this up? Why do I want to uh, scold this person? Is this for their good? Am I doing this for their good? For example, I see that uh, uh, the, the man, uh, my, my acquaintance is going down the wrong road or I see that uh, that uh, that female friend of mine is, is um, setting herself up for uh, a, a difficult road ahead of her or or do I want to bring up this and, and speak about this because I want to make myself higher because I want to make myself look better because I want to put down this person, because I want to make fun of this person, because I want to make this person feel bad. What, what are the real reasons why I want to um, have this conversation? Uh, do I want to show that I have power over this person? If it's not the first reason, if it's not for the person's betterment, then don't bring it up and don't have the conversation. Because you're making the same mistake, uh, the same kind of mistake that that person is making. So above all, try to understand your motive for wanting to engage in this conversation and bring up this, uh, this topic uh, when it may be very difficult. So remember, when we bring up something uh, about someone else, when we uh, raise uh, some concerns about something we've observed, remember that we're, we're going right to the foundation of that person. 
uh, it can be something very difficult for them to accept. Uh, I have said many times in the past uh, to you uh, that um, there's nothing uh, uh, larger in someone's mind than their self-image, than who they think they are. And now we're going to go and say, listen, old, old person, uh, old friend, you think that you're so great that you're like an angel without any kind of uh, uh, flaws. But I've got to tell you something sad. You are doing the wrong thing in this situation or in that situation. And this is like a shock to the person that hears it. It's like a, an earthquake. It's, it's like a, an override of their system. That's why, my dear brothers and sisters, this is something very painful for the person who's going to hear it. And how can you uh, take away the pain? How can you anesthetize the pain? It's not possible. So one solution would be to invite this person, make them some coffee with some sugar in it, ask them if they want some cookies or some cake. Uh, yeah, I want some cookies or cake. Uh, maybe you'd like some more, maybe you'd like another cookie. Uh, sure, I'd like another cookie. Are you comfortable in that seat? Yeah, I'm feeling comfortable. But listen, uh, now I have to tell you something. And it's uh, something important. It's something that you're doing, and you're doing it wrong. So that's one way to try to anesthetize the pain. There is another way to try to dull the pain uh, when you have to uh, bring up something that's going to uh, shatter someone's self-image. Another way uh, to do it is to say, listen, my friend, I have a problem and I have to talk to you about it. And um, it's, it's not always going to be uh, easy, and it, you have to uh, be truthful. You can't just make up the, uh, the story uh, and, and ask for guidance. It, it's supposed to be truthful. And so, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say that there's a, a married couple, and uh, they're having hard times. And they uh, go past each other in the hallway. Uh, and the wife says to the husband, you know, your life is a total mistake. And then he's going to leave the house and go to work. You know that this is going to be difficult for this man. You know that there are people... When they hear something like this, it's uh, very difficult. Try to tell something to your parents that you feel they should know, or to your uh, spouse, or to your brother or your sister. Try to tell your teacher at school something that they're doing wrong. Or your professor. Or maybe try telling the priest in your parish that they're doing something wrong. It's very difficult for us to actually do it and to take that step. But I'm asking you, uh, without uh, really joking about this, that you should tell people uh, 
when they are doing something wrong. But we don't want to uh, build hell for the person or for ourselves. So we're not trying to be mean to the person. We're just trying to expose the error in a way that shows kindness. It's, uh, it's similar to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Uh, I get very emotional when I uh, say the Mass. It's, uh, it's something very powerful. And so the Mass has, uh, has uh, transpired, and I go into the uh, sacristy uh, to, um, uh, to put my robes away and uh, uh, to leave. And uh, a woman knocks at the door, an old woman, and she says, uh, Dear priest, uh, can you please uh, give me uh, Holy Communion? I, I was late. And so I have to go and uh, uh, put my robes back on and uh, give her Holy Communion. Uh, yes, she was late. But this might be the last chance she has. I don't know what can happen uh, when she leaves the sacristy. She may uh, live for many, many years or this may be her last moments on the, on the earth. Um, other people will come to the sacristy after Mass and they will say to me, you know, Father... You, you, your homily was bad, or you, you said something wrong, or uh, they, will, they will tell me uh, the things that they dislike. And then they'll end by saying, have a good day. And so I'll say uh, to the person, uh, give me a moment, let me finish taking uh, the robes off, and... Uh, and maybe we should have this conversation uh, tomorrow, perhaps. <laughs> this is actually happens often. Uh, I just um, uh, led a series of, uh, of of conferences during uh, during Lent at a nearby church. And when one of my uh, homilies was over and the mass was over, uh, a woman came to the sacristy and said, I have a, I have a few uh, things I want to talk to you about, Father. And uh, she said, uh, I've written them all down here in this, uh, and you could read about them in this envelope. So I opened this envelope uh, that she left me with, and there was a big analysis of uh, some of the mistakes I've I've made in the in the homily, and I'm not saying that uh, this analysis was wrong. But you see, this whole mass that I was saying, and this whole conference that I was leading. I had difficulty. So, you know, uh, the next day when it was time to do the Mass and uh, the conference again, I, I really had a hard time. It, 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 it really had an effect on me. So I'm, uh, I'm pleading with you, the next time uh, you have a discussion with your husband or with your wife or with uh, uh, a neighbor or a family friend, Think about uh, what you're going to say. Think about uh, why, what your motivation is for saying it, and how to be kind. And be patient. Patience. Yesterday, I told you, I, I told you, for example, someone may say, uh, what you need to do to make your life better. 
and you're still repeating the mistakes. You're still doing it. My brothers and sisters, be patient. Don't expect big changes immediately. So you, you, so the person goes on and says, I told you about these mistakes. I told you how to make your life better. And you're still repeating them. And you didn't listen to me. And uh, see here, the, you're trying to establish that you know something better. And you're also not being patient with this person. Jesus said, uh, before we start to um, uh, pull out uh, the thorn in our brother's eye, we have to pull out the log in our eye. So, of course, we have to bring up things and talk about difficult things. But we should do it with love and with kindness. And my dear brothers and sisters, uh, one more idea I have uh, that I'd like to share. Um, when we uh, bring up something uh, to uh, someone that's difficult, it's very painful. Remember that. It's difficult. If somebody uh, then says to you, uh, you know, you actually, uh, you make sense, you're, you, you're right. You may hear this response. Uh, the person may apologize. The person may say, you know, I, I did, I acted very badly or I did something wrong. And, and this is a difficult moment for that person and that's why it should be short and to the point. Don't drag this out. Don't be like, oh, yes, you, look at you, sinner. Now how are we going to fix this? Don't keep dwelling on it and bringing it back up to the forefront. Okay, so, um, uh, for example, if, uh, if you're a husband and you've let down your wife or your family, uh, but you're truly sorry and you've apologized, then it's not right for the wife to keep bringing up this point, to keep uh, mentioning something that the husband is genuinely sorry about and has apologized for. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, uh, if we think about it, a good dentist, a good dentist is someone who does the job well and who does the job quickly. Uh, uh, a good dentist doesn't say, what do you think we should do, patient? What do you think about this situation? Maybe we could do this, or maybe we could do that, or maybe we'll still do this, and it just drags on and on. No, the, a good dentist has experience, is quick, and is capable. So, uh, try to be very to the point. Uh, listen, old friend, I, I care about you deeply, but yesterday you really hurt me. I think you know what happened and you, you, you know what I'm talking about. And give, me a five, give me a high five. Let's go for a beer or let's go for an ice cream. Think about, you know, what I said and try not to let it happen again. And don't be like, okay, well, uh, what kind of guarantee do I have that you're going to be better? Don't drag it on and on and keep talking about it. And don't say, oh, what do you think about this? And how do you uh, uh, think this situation should go? And uh, how do you feel about what happened? No, don't, don't drag it out. That's like uh, undressing somebody in public and making them squirm. Quick to the point. 
Okay, there are times when a situation needs more conversation and is more difficult. So in those cases, it won't always be easy. But for many, many things, misunderstandings, we can quickly try to resolve them, to forgive, to be patient, to tell our friend or our, our loved one that they've done something to hurt us, but to not drag it on and on. So as we start to uh, wind down, I'd like to put out this question. If we ask ourselves, how did Jesus love us? The first answer, the instantaneous answer, is he loved us in such a way and so deeply that he allowed himself to be crucified. So, let us remember this, that if you want to love someone, if you're out there in the congregation or you're listening to this, and you want to love someone, uh, like Jesus, uh, who showed us how to love, we must also be prepared to be injured, to be hurt, like Jesus was on the cross. And there are many people who are scared to be hurt. Oh, you hurt me? Well, now I'm shutting you out. I'm closing the door on you. And I'm not going to I'm not going to talk to you anymore. And I'm building a wall to keep you out because uh, I don't want to be hurt by you again. And so uh in a marriage, this could look something like uh, the wife feeling so hurt that she sits in the room alone and doesn't speak to the husband, or vice versa. Uh, the husband uh, stops speaking to the wife. But you see, this solution is like a self-destruct button or a self-injury. Uh, uh, because this doesn't lead to the peace or, or the happy resolution. This is a scar that forms not only from the outside, but from our inside. I once said to you, dear women uh, in the congregation, that every one of you who have, who have had a child and who have breastfed the child. Probably uh, more than once, uh, this child uh, did something uh, unpleasant, like, for example, threw up on, on you. Maybe the uh, the, the, the food disagreed with the baby or it didn't have to be breastfed it could be a, a young child who you're feeding soup and you made this wonderful soup and you worked so hard and the child had it and then threw it all up but oftentimes the mother will just say oh dear sweetie uh, it's okay uh, no, no, no harm done uh, a mother is very uh, quick to forgive her child for uh, something that upsets her. But please believe me that we are often vomiting on each other uh, as, as adults, not in the true sense, uh, but in the sense of, of saying things to injure each other. Of course, uh, it's obvious that in a marriage or in a family, we can't allow ourselves to be uh, put down or to be uh, constantly uh, under attack. Uh, we can't allow ourselves to be a punching bag for someone else, like a boxer who's training for a fight. 
But on the other side of this, we have to remember that when these things happen, when we fight back, when we raise our voice, we are injuring each other. I can hurt somebody, and if that has happened, uh, I apologize for this. Uh, you are able to hurt me. Uh, you can do something to hurt me. Uh, a family uh, can uh, hurt each other and, and cause scars to form. We're not supposed to let these, uh, these scars uh, happen uh, without uh, any opposition. But, uh, obviously, but we heard uh, today in the scripture reading, uh, the first reading, which uh, wasn't part of this video, uh, but uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, how when the Apostles were going around to establish the early Christian communities, how it was very difficult. It wasn't a cakewalk. There was many blisters on the soles of the feet and uh, many disappointments along the way. But it was all about how the apostles looked at the situation. They could have complained. They could have been upset. They could have uh, said this is going nowhere. But for every small victory, they rejoiced and gave thanks to God. So uh, through many blisters and through many scars, um, we move forward. And Jesus allowed himself to be injured, allowed himself to be crucified. He, he cried for, from the pain and for us. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment. Love. Love one another as I have loved you. This, for us, is a very uh, uh, concrete and difficult uh, task to achieve. So we have a lot of work to do. And it's often, we can compare it to working in a mine and digging out, uh, for example, coal or metal. It's very uh, difficult work, and it's very uh, hard work, and often we will get dirty from it. I am saying this today to provoke you to understand the magnitude and the importance of this commandment that Jesus gave. Love one another as I have loved you. And uh, uh, going back to uh, uh, the writings of Simon Seberi, uh, he, he exposed uh, something very important that we as Christians, we don't even think about this commandment. Or we just kind of assume that we do it without actually working and striving to do it. That we, in other words, take it for granted. Oh, it didn't even come to my mind to think that I have to try to arrange my life in a way that will support this commandment. It didn't even come to my mind that I have to, for example, love my uncle, who maybe was mean to me when I was little. It, it, it absolutely doesn't even enter my mind to love uh, people I see every day on the street or on the bus uh, or on the way to work or on the way home. Like strangers who I don't know, but nevertheless, it doesn't even enter my mind to think about them and their needs. In fact, I, I don't even really care who they are. I don't want to know who they are. And so oftentimes we find ourselves in church saying, I, I don't get this reading, I don't understand what this is about. 
you know, I tried, but I don't get it. And uh, we, we must understand that the whole New Testament is based on this new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. If we understand this commandment and if we strive to keep this commandment, then the scriptures of the New Testament become alive for us. I repeat one more time. This commandment is the flavor of the gospel. This is the whole car, uh, to use an example, the whole car. But if you don't have the key to that car, the car won't start. This is the key to the car. Um, Christianity, without this new commandment, to love one another as I have loved you, as Jesus has loved us, it's just a pile of metal. It's not even a car. Oh my goodness, uh, she wants me to go to church. Oh my goodness, what am I? Why do I gotta go to church? Oh, it's Sunday. Why do they nag me? Why is my mother telling me to go to church? Why is my wife telling me to go to church? Why? Oh my gosh, why go? Why do I have to pray? Oh, it's too bad that it's. Uh, Uh, when you uh, when you put the key of the new commandment of Jesus into the car, the car of the New Testament, the car will start and you can drive it. It will take you where you need to go, and God willing, it will take you straight to heaven. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.